All right. Good morning again, man. Great job, Hunter and Chelsea. And for those that don't know, that's Adam back on the video, just doing all the extra work in our new setup, which is also called Makeshift. The rain happened this week and we needed to go somewhere different. Uh, and so great job with worship. Hey, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a prediction go like terribly wrong? Like I'm talking like really bad, like there was something predicted and it didn't even come close to what the prediction really said. Uh, for me, and I'm going to age myself just a bit here, so bear with me a little bit, but does anybody remember the Y2K days? This is actually a Time Magazine cover from Y2K, and so I know I'm going to age myself a little bit, but anybody around my age, which is almost 40, uh, you remember that it was utter chaos when the Y2K was predicted, and what happened was we were worried about computer codes, and we were worried about changing from 1999 to the year 2000, and at two-digit code, should have been a four-digit code, and because it wasn't, it was gonna trigger utter chaos. In fact, there were many evangelicals that I would uh, be ashamed to say, uh, say a little bit. They thought that that was actually going to trigger end times things that we see in the Bible and that we were gonna see Jesus' return in the year 2000. I actually was in Tempe, Arizona at a football game for the University of Tennessee. We were listening to Billy Idol, and Billy Idol missed the actual countdown by about 15 seconds. So I surely thought Y2K was a real thing, uh, but it didn't. We clicked over into the new year and nothing happened. Prediction gone terribly wrong. Or how about some of these really bad predictions? Read this one with me. It said, we don't like their sound and guitar music is on the way out. That was record producers, Decca Recording Company on why they declined to sign the Beatles back in 1962. Eh, probably a bad, bad, bad prediction there, right? Or how about this one? The telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is of inherently no value to us. <laughs> Western Union back in 1876, an internal memo. Again, prediction gone wrong. How about this one? Television won't last because people will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. Daryl Zanuck, movie producer of 20th Century Fox back in 1946. Little did he know, we would definitely be okay staring at these little devices every single night on Netflix and other things, right? Or how about this one? My favorite for all you uh, Google fans out there. There's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. Steve Ballmer, former Microsoft CEO back in 2007 as we now produce this with an iPad device, a phone, and several other phones that are actually recording this too. I think that prediction may have gone a little bit wrong. You see, predicting the future is hard. It's very challenging. Uh, as a matter of fact, why don't you right now just kind of show of hands if predicting the next three days in these COVID 2020 times is a little bit difficult for you. So just show me some hands if like predicting the next three days is a challenge for you. And doesn't the chaotic nature of today really make you want to be sure of something? Just sure of anything, like just anything right now. Doesn't the fact that you can't tell what next year is going to even remotely look like make you want to hold on to something that you know to be true in its entirety? Does it want to make you, does it make you want to like cling to that? But here's what I want you to know and kind of walk away with today. I think everyone can look to the future by remembering the past. Now I know some of you are gonna say, whoa, 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 Chris, a couple weeks ago, you said that our past doesn't determine our future, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I still stand by the fact that our past doesn't determine our future. I stand by it, I want you to know something. I want you to realize that the past, specifically the past of a man named Jesus, actually does define our future. So our past doesn't define the future, but the past of Jesus and the person and the work that he did does define our future. So everyone can look to the future by simply remembering the past, not your past. In fact, I would even go as far as saying this, your past doesn't define your future because his does. See, the last couple of weeks, we've been taking a look at the book of 1 Peter. So we've been diving in and how this kind of displaced group of people that a man named Peter was writing to have been scattered because of their belief in Jesus. 
of people that had been uh, scattered uh, and tortured and killed and just really going through really challenging times, how they were living a hold of a life where I bet they just wanted to take hold of something that could be sure. Every day was changing for them. Like I said, people were being persecuted, tortured, and killed. And I would almost bet that they too wanted to know what their future had in store. I wonder what predictions they made. That's where my mind wanders to. Like, what were they sitting around talking about? And what were the predictions that they had Y2K-like that were going to happen? Turn with me to the book of 1 Peter. We're going to be in that this morning. And for those of you that are just joining us, you can follow along with us in an app. We have an app. Journey Point Church is the name. You can go to any app store. We even included Android devices, even though Steve Ballmer was wrong about what was going to happen with iPhone. We just went ahead and did that anyways. Uh, but we have it on there, Journey Point Church. There is an, a Bible that's on there. You can follow along with us. There's also message notes on there if you want to take notes from today and email them to yourself. Also, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, this is your first time kind of kicking the tires of Journey Point, there's a connect card on there. You can fill that out and that sends some stuff to us. We in, then in turn would send you a token of our appreciation for coming and joining us this morning just to say thank you. And for those of you that uh, want to text it in, you can text connect to the number 720-780-6969. And in fact, if, if you don't have a Bible, you can just text us on that number as well. We would love to send you a Bible in the mail. Last, but certainly not least, for those of you that call Journey Point home, you've kicked the tires, you said that I'm not that weird and everybody else is pretty good too, uh, that you've, you've said this is my home. This is also the place where you can give back to God what is his. You know, I tell people every week, we are able to do things like this. We're able to have technology. We're able to even meet in schools. We're able to go and serve Denver, De Denver Rescue Mission and all these other types of places and the things that we do, hand out popsicles like we are next week because of the faithfulness and generosity of those people that call Journey Point home. Know that when you give to Journey Point. You're actually not giving to Journey Point, but you're giving through Journey Point. And you can do all that through our app. So turn with me, 1 Peter, we're going to be in chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Let me read. Here's what it says. It says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched and carefully investigated. Love that. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. They inquired into what time or, cir or what circumstances the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified in advance to the sufferings of Christ and to the glories that would follow. Again, keep in mind, these are prophets in the Old Testament times that they're talking about. It says it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. These things have now been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. Let's pray and then look at some implications that Peter gives us from this passage in the book that he writes to a scattered and a dispersed and scared people about what the future holds. Father, we love you. I thank you that this morning we can sit here and again, look at a book that has so much information in it that we can take a peek into what you're trying to say to us. God, that we can use a 2,000-year-old story and even further than that, these prophets from the Old Testament. God, we can apply it to our lives today as we try to take hold and look to what the future has in store for us. God, do the work that only you can do, and we do it for your name and for your honor and for your glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, so here's what we have to put in context here just a little bit to begin this passage, right? So for those of you that missed last week or are just now catching in with this, this verse 10 says concerning this salvation. Well, if you turn back to verse 9, it talks about the goal of our faith is the salvation in Jesus. And it talks about salvation. In fact, this whole first part of 1 Peter is really identifying the hope that we have because of the salvation that we have in Jesus. And what we're talking about here is the inheritance that followers of Jesus, those people that have said yes to Jesus, have the goal of their faith that they have in their hands. Peter really, through that, is telling us, in my opinion, that we have two ways that we can use this past, this inheritance, what we know now from these prophets of the old times. And here's the first one. We'll get right after it. It says, I think what Peter is saying is one way that we can use the past is to let the past control the future. Now, don't don't step back on me here. I know some of you are control freaks and you don't want anybody else controlling your future. But what I'm telling you is Peter is saying, let the past control your future. 
You see, whether you're a follower of Jesus watching today or someone that is here still processing your thoughts about Christianity and about the Bible and all of these other things, the past of Jesus is what we're talking about here today. Not the past of people, not the past of prophets, not the past of you or anybody else, but the past of Jesus is what we're focusing on. You see, Paul is saying here that these prophets from the Old Testament times, they actually talked and discussed or predicted, if you will, what was to come through the life of Jesus. And here's what they actually define what was going to come through this Messiah, this Savior, this man named Jesus that was to happen. They actually said that grace would come to you, right? It says concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you. Now that you, of course, is the people that Peter is addressing in this letter, but that you is you and I today as well. We can take hold of this same claim that Peter was writing to encourage these people in chaotic times. And what's amazing, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but I love that these prophets had to actually look back to see what they wrote down. You see, here's the thing. The, the Bible is what we call the inspired word of God. So it's used by men to write it. And so these men were so inspired by God, or the Holy Spirit, as the verse says in the end, they were so inspired that they actually had to go back to check to go, hey, what is it that God was saying through us? Like we were just writing what he wanted us to write. And let me go back and check what it is that God actually said, because this is God's word. And what they found was this. They found this word grace. You see, grace ultimately is just the unmerited favor to the undeserving. Now, some kind of churchy words that we throw around a lot that sometimes get confused are justice, mercy, and grace. And just for the benefits of this morning, I want to define them a little bit. Justice is getting what we deserve, right? Justice is saying, hey, we need to get what we deserve, whether that be as human beings, whether that be as a race, or whether that be as a people, or whether that be as someone that is sinful in nature and lives outside of the way God deserve, desires. Sometimes we ask for justice, and sometimes we need it, and sometimes I'm grateful that we don't have justice, like when I sin and fall short of God's glory. But then mercy, on the other hand, is not getting what we deserve. I mean, the Bible actually says that sin in our life deserves a penalty of death. So I'm kind of grateful for the mercy on my life that I don't get what it is that I actually deserve, right? And then last, but certainly not least, we have grace, which is getting what we don't deserve. That's salvation. That's saying yes to Jesus. That's having a right relationship with him. And ultimately, it's getting what we don't deserve. I'm not worthy to have had Jesus die on a cross for me and for my shortcomings in the way that he desired me to live. In fact, right now, if, if you feel any ounce, any amount of grace whatsoever in your life, just type the words grace into the comments below. I mean, we have grace upon grace upon grace. We get what we don't deserve. There's actually a passage in the book of Romans that a man named Paul wrote. Paul was writing to Romans. And in that passage, he actually says this. He said, but God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Grace, getting what we don't deserve. Years ago, I started a career in medical sales and I had decided to apply for a bunch of jobs in medical sales because quite frankly, I wasn't qualified to be in medical sales. I had two degrees in sport management. I had never done business to business sales before, but I thought, hey, who cares? Let me apply. We'll see what happens. We'll just go from there, right? So after applying for several ones, having a couple of interviews, getting turned down by one, someone finally took a chance on me. I got a job in medical sales. And so you know what I did? I was grateful for the way that they hired me. So what I did was I just kind of kicked back, kind of passed by, just collected a check, you know, did those types of things because I was so grateful for the grace that I had by getting a job. No, wrong. I worked my tail off in that job. I knew that I was undeserving for what I had been given. And so I wanted to prove that I was going to be the employee that they hired that did what he said he could do and follow through with what he said he could do. And that I was grateful for them taking a chance on me. You see, I don't know where you are in your faith today. I don't know what that journey looks like for you. I don't know what your daily rhythms look like, but I'm telling you this, no matter where you are or what your circumstance is right now, you have grace upon grace upon grace, and it is time to stop living in a doom and gloom world, worried about the future, scared about the future, focusing on our circumstance at hand, and it is time to be thankful for what God has given us, even though we don't deserve it. 
It's time to be grateful for the grace that he's given us in our life. It's time for us to not let our current situation control our past, but to let the grace that we've been given run the day. It's time to start waking up, being grateful for what we have and being grateful for what God's done for us through his son, Jesus. And it's time to let others see that joy that we have because we have a hope and a faith in him. It's time to look different than the rest of the world. See, if you're watching today and you're a follower of Jesus, the question becomes is, would your neighbor know right now from your life and the way that you attack every single day that you have grace upon grace from the Lord? Would anybody looking from the outside in, would a coworker that you're with every single day know that you have a different hope, that you have a different outlook on what's to come in and through all of this because you're grateful for something more? Would anybody of a family member even know that you have anything to be grateful for? Sometimes I think we can check our social media feeds and find that out very quickly, right? And what's amazing is that God's past faithfulness is always an indicator of his future faithfulness for us. And if you're being honest with yourself, you know that to be true. You also know that his grace didn't just stop with the person and work of Jesus, that if you really identified and evaluated your life compared to the rest of the world, you have grace upon grace upon grace. You have a ton of grace in your life and you have to, and you'll have more to come because that's the God that we serve. I have to challenge you to stop letting your current situation control your future and start letting the past, not your past, but the past of Jesus control your future. That's the first thing that Peter tells us in this. But the second thing is this. Don't only let the past control the future, but also let the past convert the future. You see, so these prophets were told about this Jesus to come, this Savior, this Messiah, right? And it didn't mean that they didn't have a reason to be grateful in their own time or that they didn't have a salvation in God because they did. What it meant, though, was that they were to continue to prophesy about this grace that was to come until it actually came so that it could be passed on from generation to generation to generation. <laughs> it says they inquired about into what time or what circumstances, right, that the glories that were to follow were coming. I'm still just blown away that they were so in tune with God that they had to go back to check what it was that God was saying to them. I mean, I'm just telling you right now, we've got to get into the word, into the Bible more than we've ever been so that we know these things to be true, so that we have a different hope and a different outlook on the future. And as they dove in to what God revealed to them, they found out that what they were prophesying was for others and not themselves. Talk about a little bit of a letdown, right? They found out that it was for other people to come and not for themselves and that their role was to convert other people's future based on what God was telling them. So let me say it another way that's really simple. The gospel came to them on its way to someone else. The gospel came to these prophets on its way to someone else, on its way to someone else, on its way to someone else. Look at what verse 12 says. Verse 12 says, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but who? But you. And again, Peter's talking to these uh, people in uh, tough times and dark situations here, but it says that it was revealed not to themselves, but you, and that's you and I today. Not just these scattered people, but you and I that are reading this inspired word of God. And look at this, Peter actually even doubles down on it. He said that these things have now been what? Announced to you, again, you and I today, through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. You see, when this message finally came to these disciples back in this context time and these people that were scattered, it wasn't their first time hearing about this Savior, this Messiah, this Jesus. What you have to understand is that from a little child, from as far as they can remember, they were talked about the Messiah that was to come. And so when Jesus actually came and began his earthly ministry, they were ready because people were talking about it and talking about it and talking about it and talking about it until finally they're seeing this man named Jesus do what these Old Testament prophets had proclaimed that he was going to be doing. The message of the gospel, the salvation that was coming through Jesus to these people, these prophets, was on its way to someone else, namely the people that lived and walked with Jesus. And the kicker, 
The same is true for you and I today. Literally, this message that we are reading from Peter, it was told to a group of people that were suffering and hurting and in their pain and suffering, Peter encouraged them about the salvation that they had through Jesus, which in turn led them to live lives where they told others about this different hope that they could have, which ultimately went from generation to generation to generation that now is coming out of my mouth to you today. Some people say this book is old, this Bible. I am fascinated that from generation to generation to generation, the gospel came to other people on its way to someone else so that you and I could be talking about it here today. We're here today because the gospel message, the good news, what we call it, of Jesus came to others on its way to us. <laughs> and watch this. I, I love this. It says not just that, but it says it sent by the Holy, uh, by the Holy Spirit from heaven Angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. You, you ever feel like we're like watching the wrong scoreboard? <laughs> like we just have the wrong metrics for the scoreboard that we have. I'll give you a quick score, story with an example of that. I think our, our scoreboard with kids is way off. You know, a lot of times we focus on careers, we focus on knowledge, we focus on tests, we focus on athletic ability, we focus on the how many grandkids they produce for us, so on and so forth, right? And ultimately, I think that's the wrong scoreboard. And I came to that realization about two years ago. You see, we, we moved here. We moved to Denver to start Journey Point. There's no questions about that. And we always tell people that's why we moved here. And a lot of people always ask us why we came to start Journey Point. In fact, a couple of years ago, uh, we were having a conversation with a parent from Paxton's class. And again, scoreboard, we talk about grades, we talk about athletic ability and everything else. But as, I'm having, as we're having this conversation with this parent, who's an African-American dad of a kid that's in Paxton's class. He says, hey, well, why did you move here to start this? Well, we came to start a church and started asking us about the church. And what we always tell people about Journey Point is that above anything else, we wanted to start a church that lasts. We wanted to start a church that's for the community. But even more so than that, we wanted to start a multicultural, multi-generational church. And a lot of that's because I grew up multiculturally, multi-generationally, very diverse in, in background and all that. And so we just said that we're, regardless of what we do, we want to have a multicultural and multi-generational church. And the, the dad said, yeah, I could tell that. <laughs> a little worried about what that meant, but we didn't know. And he said, because your son doesn't see barriers to the different color that he is based on my son. And that doesn't happen all the time. I'm going to tell you, Paxton is really athletic. Paxton is very smart. But there is no greater thing that I rejoice in or try to catch a glimpse of than stories like that. And I think the same is true, right? We do all of these things for the Lord. We try to read. We try to pray. We try to do all of this other type of stuff. Those things are great. And those things make the Lord happy. And those things make angels rejoice. But when we want to know what heaven roars about, when we want to know what the angels are rejoicing about, I think it's when we open our mouths and tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. When we use the fact that the, the gospel message came to me on its way to someone else, and that's the scoreboard that we need to have. See, and the question for us, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, is this message that we have, is this message that you are hearing, maybe even if for the first time today, will it stop with you? I'm so grateful it didn't stop with these in this book of 1 Peter. But would you take this hope, would you take this truth, this grace, and are you going to let this message stop with you? Or will you take the message and share it with other people? Which, by the way, is terrifying. And we live in a divisive world where if I have a belief a certain way, it's, it's hard for me to talk about it. And so what I do is I just don't want to talk about it, right? Because I'm afraid I'm going to offend somebody one way or the other. And I think the same is true even with a message like this with the gospel. So what we do is we just don't talk about it at all. And I'm grateful that that's not what these Old Testament and New Testament people did because I have the message because they did open their mouths even in the midst of divisiveness and what it may look like or feel. You know, for me, a lot of people ask, what is a great way to walk through and share the story with someone? We call it evangelism. Evangelism is taking my journey and intersecting it with God's journey. And so where those two journeys intersect, that's just basically sharing the story of God, the gospel, the message, right? And so an easy way to do that is by an acronym called BLESS. It's super simple and it's something easy to take by and it's not something that we have to get all worked up about. It's simple as this. It's B, begin with prayer. Are you even praying for anybody that you could maybe share the story of Jesus with? That's a great place to start. 
once maybe that happens, then meet that person or engage with that person. And then here's the other thing, just listen. Man, we live in a world where we don't listen a whole lot, where we talk too much and we want to tell everybody what's going on. I'm so guilty of that. But just listen. The next thing we can do is, is eat. Just eat with them. You don't have to eat. You can do coffee. You can just spend time with them is what that is getting to, right? When you eat a meal with someone, you have the right to begin talking and conversing with them. And then after we have begun to pray for them, after we have listened to them, and even if we eat with them, I guarantee you, you will know a way that you can serve them. You'll know some way that you can serve them one way or the other. And then the last thing, last but certainly not least, if I have prayed for them, if I have listened to them, if I have dined with them in some kind of way and I've served them in some kind of way, I have the right to share the way my story intersected with God's story and talked about what Jesus has done for us. Journey Point, here's what I want you to do today. I want you to write down one name of somebody that you will bless this week. Just one. Don't take on a task that you can't handle, but just one person that you can bless this week. As a matter of fact, if, if you're committed to doing this, don't put the name of the person in there because if they're watching, that becomes awkward. But maybe just put a right arrow. Uh, put a right arrow on the comment section below that you're going to begin just praying that you would bless just one person this week week so that you could see where your story intersects with God's story. The question is, will you help others look to the future because of the past? In a time where there are more questions and answers, will you let your neighbor know what was done for them? Will you let your coworker know the hope that they can have in the person of Jesus? Will you encourage a family member by telling them that their past doesn't determine their future, but Jesus's does? And if you're sitting here today, which I know every week we do, and you're someone that has never said yes to following Jesus, I 100% can't think of any better day, any better time than to finally say yes to Jesus and to place your hope and your faith into his past and not yours. You see, saying yes to Jesus means that you understand that his past, which was his death, which was his resurrection and which is his taking our place on that cross, changes your future. Saying yes just means that you believe in it, that you want a right relationship with him from living outside of the way that he desired for you to live and that you trust him to lead your life. That you trust that his past faithfulness is always an indicator of his future faithfulness that you're going to let the past control your future, that you're going to let the past convert the future of not only yourself, but others around you, that you're going to let the gospel come to you on its way to someone else. If you've never done that, today is the day to do that. And in a minute when we pray, I'll walk you through how you can pray just simply to God, thanking him for what he did and saying yes to him. And if that is you, I would love for you to text the word, I said yes, no spaces, to 720-780-6969. And we would love nothing more than to start a new journey with you on this faith journey that quite frankly, you need people walking alongside of you. You need people encouraging. You need people to have the message that came to them on its way to you and other people. And so let's just take a moment. Let's thank God for the message that has come to us from generation to generation to generation to finally to you and I today. And let's pray. Lord, we love you. <clears throat> we are so grateful that this message didn't stop with those that Peter wrote this book to. I'm so grateful that they took seriously the gospel that came to them on the way to someone else. I'm so thankful that these prophets from this Old Testament time didn't stop telling people and telling people and telling people from generation to generation about the Jesus that was to come. God, I'm so grateful that when Jesus did come, he did the work that he did, the good news, the gospel is what we call it. And I'm just so thankful that from generations for thousands of years that we can take this Bible, that we can take this word that you inspired for so long to so many and that we can use it to apply to our lives today. 
Father, I pray for those that have said yes to Jesus, for those that are followers of Jesus, they would take seriously the command that you give us to let the gospel come to us on its way to someone else. God, that they would think about neighbors, that they would think about their community, that they would think about their workplaces, that they would think about their friends. God, that you would draw names and pictures of faces and families and those that are hurting right now and, and Lord, just honestly wandering around not knowing what their future looks like. And that you would give them the encouragement, the strength, Lord, to bless them, to share their story and how it intersected with your story. And God, pray and hope that you transform their life the same way that you transform theirs. God, I pray that you would give us the encouragement to do that on a consistent basis, to be looking for those conversations, God. And I pray that for anybody today that has never said yes to you, God, that you would give them the hope and the faith and the encouragement and the strength to say yes today. And that's so simple, Lord. All we have to do is say, yes. Jesus, yes. I thank you for the work that you did. Jesus, forgive me for the way that I've lived outside of the way that you desired me to live. And I say yes to you leading my life. Father, I pray that you would bring life transformation to us. God, that we would have growth in our lives from the way that we're connected even in desperate, dark, weird COVID-19 times, Lord. I pray that you would do the work that only you could do. Father, it's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. Hey, again, if today for the very first time you said yes to Jesus, please text, I said yes, no spaces, to 720-780-6969. We'd love to resource you and pray with you and begin this journey with you. But begin praying, church about the one person that you can bless. Begin thinking about the one person that you can begin praying for. Let's think of our neighbors. Let's think of our coworkers. Let's think of our friends. Let's think of our family. And let's begin to show them a different hope that they can have because of the past work that Jesus did.